replaceable. You can say that again. Yeah, he's irreplaceable. <laughs> <laughs> Our story is not a secret. We were just little tiny babies. We didn't have a father. We were fatherless. I don't really remember it very much. Me either. We were pretty young. But we were adopted into a loving family. Today is a special day. We all know that we honor our fathers. And I want to honor especially those like uh, with the children in our story there in our video that have stepped up and become a father to the fatherless. Uh, I really salute you and I really thank you for that. Uh, but given what is happening in our country today and given what is happening in our world, I mean, you just got to turn the news and see what's going on. It's a tough world we're living in. I want to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with the man in this room. Uh, not that this is not going to apply to the ladies. Of course it will. It's the Word of God. The Word of God applies to everybody. But I really want to have a conversation with the man. And I know we men, we don't like stories and flowers and all. Go, we go straight to the gut, right? So I'm going to stay as straight like it is. And, and for those ladies that are still looking for a husband out there or think on getting married one day, listen, take some notes. Maybe uh, you can, you know, <laughs> qualify your man based on some of these things that we talked about here today. So my objective here today is not to offend anyone. I really don't want to offend anyone. And if I do, I ask for your forgiveness up front. That's okay? <laughs> I just want to have, I want to really challenge every man in this room like God has challenged me this week as I study this passage uh, to be real, to be real men. Um, the reason for that is that I believe that most of the challenges we face in society today is because we have a lack of manhood in our society. Um, the boys and young men today are growing with the wrong definition of what it is to be a man. They get it from the sitcoms and the shows and, and TV that all they portray is a guy that cannot do anything. I mean, it's sickening to me to see some of the sitcoms. And yes, I have to admit they're funny sometimes. But man, they have taken the role of the father completely out the window. And we are completely useless. And that's pretty much the example that our young men have this day. In this country, we have a crisis, and the crisis, crisis is called fatherlessness. The National Center for Fathering says this, that 24.7 million children, that is 33% of all the children in the United States, live absent of their biological father. Just think about that for a second. One out of every three kids you see on the street don't have a, their biological father at home. 
Fatherlessness is associated with almost every societal ill facing this country today. From poverty to drug and alcohol abuse, school dropouts, physical and mental health issues. The impact is incredible. Listen to these numbers. 71% of all high school dropouts come from a fatherless home. 71%. 71% of all teenage pregnancies come from a fatherless home. 85% of all children with behavioral issues come from a fatherless home. 90% of all homeless and runaway children come from a fatherless home. 63% of all suicides come from a fatherless home. And 85% of all the youth in prison come from a fatherless home. We have a crisis. Someone said this, if fatherlessness was classified as a disease, we would have an epidemic. That's what we have. We have an epidemic. And only the man in this country can solve this problem. It is up to us men. It is up to us to be real men. Our countries and our cities, they need real men. They need men who will stand up and who will step up and do what is needed to do. Do what God has called us to do. We need to become the leaders again in our society. We must stop watching from the sidelines and we must stop delegating what God has entrusted us to do to our wives. We've been doing that for too long. And I know it's easy to get home, get the remote, sit in the couch and watch. Hey, I do it. I know it's easy. The hard part is to make the decision to get up from that couch and dedicate some time to your kids. Dedicate some time to your wives. We've got to stop being selfish and careless and lazy when it comes to parenting and discipling our kids. We sure have time to watch uh, basketball playoff games, right, and football games. But we certainly don't have the time to do the discipling. It's easier to take them to the Christian school or take them to Sunday school and let them do the discipling. And then complain because the kid doesn't come out like we wanted him to come out. <laughs> We must get our priorities straight. We must get our priorities straight for the benefit of our families, for the benefit of our children, for the benefit of our country, ultimately. Today we're going to look at a passage. It's a biblical passage. It gives us a biblical example of a real man. It's a man that God himself is describing in this passage and by whose description we can learn some qualities of a real man. And sometimes if we're not careful in this passage, we can just go right by it. It's in Genesis 18, and if you have your Bibles, open it to Genesis 18. You know, God is about to go to Sodom and Gomorrah, and the, the story is so interesting that sometimes we fly by the details. But in verse 19, in verse 19, God himself says this. For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, as we open your word, we know we're incapable of understanding it on our own. The Bible says that the gospel of God is foolishness to man. So, Father, this morning I ask for the Holy Spirit to be here, to indwell us, and give us the understanding necessary from this verse, Lord. Father, be you the one that speaks to our hearts. And, Father, I ask you, do not allow my humanness to interfere with your message, Lord. I pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. I want to read that verse one more time. It says, for I, this is God talking, for I, God, have chosen him, Abraham, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham 
what he has spoken about him. My brothers, we need to become real men. And the first thing I see in this passage is for us to be real men, we have to understand that we have a divine calling. You have a divine calling. He said, I, God, have chosen him, Abraham. It is God that chose Abraham. It is God that chooses each and every one of us. God is calling you. God called you, and he has called each and every one of us for a specific purpose. He has called each and every one of us here, men and women and young men and young women. He has called you for a specific purpose. Look at what it says in Ephesians 2.10. We all know this verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for what? For good works, for a purpose, which God prepared beforehand so that we will walk in them. Second Timothy 1.9 says it this way, God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, there's the divine calling, not according to our works. God didn't wake up yesterday and say, man, that kid Mark really sings well. Let me make him a worship leader. That didn't happen like that. Let's, it was a holy calling, not according to what we do, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. This was way back when, before my father and my mother even thought, maybe before they even, well, definitely before they even knew each other. God already had me in his mind with a purpose. Wow. That's amazing, isn't it? God thought of you before anybody else thought of you. And he created you with a purpose. We have a divine calling. And the calling is so that we accomplish that purpose. Now, this is the idea. God is calling you. God has called you. How are you responding to his call? Have you responded to his call? See, you're not here by accident this morning. You may think, well, my wife dragged me or my kids dragged me. It's Father's Day. We've got to be in church. You're not here by accident. Before eternity, God knew you were going to be here, and he's calling you. How are you responding to his call? And you might say, well, Jose, why, why is he calling me? Because of the second thing, God chose you. He's calling you because he chose you. You know, he chose you to be the father of that kid that you have. He chose you to be the husband to that wife that you have. He chose you. So he's calling you because he has chosen you to give you a divine purpose in your life. And he chose you because you are perfect to fulfill that purpose. See, Ephesians 1.4 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. See, he chose you to fulfill that divine call he gave you in your life and in the life of those around you. And you can say, okay, Jose, he called me, he chose me, I understand that, but why? You know, the kids always ask, why? 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 Because God knows you. God knows you. And you know what? He knows you better than you know yourself. He made you for a specific purpose, and you made you the way you are for a specific reason. You are perfect for the call that he's put in your life. You know, and sometimes, you know, we think, well, Jose, you know, it's tough. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do that. Listen, he knows you. If he's called you to do something, don't argue with him. He has the owner's manuals on Jose. 
I haven't even seen the manual, so I don't know myself as well as he does, right? He's got the owner's manual. He created it. He wrote it. He says in, in Isaiah 43, 1, it says this. Do not fear, for I, God, has redeemed you. I have called you by name. And listen to what he says. You are mine. Isn't that great? I'm like, yes. How many people in your life tells you, don't worry, I love you just like you are because you are mine? Not many. But God does. And he knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what you're going to think before you even think it. And he still loves you in a way that he says, you are mine. <laughs> That's amazing. Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. And listen, I understand this, this passage is strictly for Jeremiah, but I really believe we can apply it to all of us. Before, he, before you were formed in the womb, he knew you. The psalmist says it on, on Psalm 139. He said, he knew me while I was in the womb. And he says, I formed you. Mom and dad, I, they were just the vehicle. He formed us. He knows us. He calls us. And brother and my sister, I know sometimes it's tough, but listen, be who God has called you to be. If he has called you to be a father, listen, be a father. Stop using excuses and be a dad. If he's called you to be a husband, be a husband. If he's called you to lead your family, lead them. Don't leave it to somebody else. I love there's a young couple that's going to get married soon, and this, this girl was in my office, and it was one of those that you don't expect certain things to come out of the mouth of such a young person, right? And she's talking to me about all these plans, and I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, you guys have thought about everything. She goes, oh, yeah, because I want my husband to lead me. I want my husband to disciple me. I want my husband to be my spiritual leader. I mean, this is a 19-year-old, 20-year-old girl telling me this stuff. And I'm going like, wow, you want to preach on Sunday? Oh, that's right. We don't allow women in the house. <laughs> Let's be real. Let's be real, man. God has a divine calling in your life. Let's do it. The second thing I see here in the passage is that you have a responsibility to disciple we have a responsibility to disciple. He says here, for I have chosen him, Abraham, so that. You hear that? So that. He chose him for a purpose, right? What is the purpose? That he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. Why did he choose Abraham? So that he can disciple his family. So that he can disciple those in his household. See, this is not only for the kids. This is for everybody. The first way he's talking about here discipling is by authority. It's by authority. He gave Abraham the authority to disciple the people in his household. He does it by authority. The word here where he says, I, so he can command his children, talks about authority, about having the authority. See, if you're the husband, Ephesians 5 tells you to wash your wife with the water of the word. That is discipleship. See, if you have a father, Deuteronomy 6, 7 says to instruct your children in the ways of the Lord. See, that is discipleship. And if you have people working for you or people surrounding you, whether male or female, in 2 Timothy and Titus, in second, in Titus 2, it tells you to teach them, instruct them in the way of the Lord. See, that is discipleship. See, we have a responsibility to disciple. And we can do it by authority. But let me ask you this. Let me tell you this. I want to clarify one thing. Nowadays, people use their authority to abuse people, to harass people, 
right? Let me tell you this. You can, you can disciple by authority. But if you're just going to talk the talk and not walk it, might as well stop talking. Okay, man? I'm talking to you, to the man. You better start walking the talk or stop talking. Because it's too easy to say, oh, do this, do that while I do this other stuff. What do they say? Do as I say and see, everybody knows the saying, right? Everybody knows the saying because that's exactly what we do. And I think it's time for the men to step up and not only disciple by authority, but more so disciple by example. We need to disciple by example. I believe that before I have the right to demand someone to behave in a certain way, I better be showing them. See, that's what gives me the right to disciple my children. When I can look at them, when I can look at my son Joel and say, Joel, just live like I live. Just do as I do. That is discipleship. The Apostle Paul told the, the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, Be imitators of me just as I am also of Christ. Follow me. Don't just do what I say, actually do what I do. You see, real men will be willing to follow before they're willing to lead. Paul said, follow me, be my imitator, because I'm imitating Christ. I'm following Christ. See, the man, we need to learn to follow Christ. And once you follow Christ, you can look at your kids and say, hey, follow me, because I'm following him. So we have a responsibility to disciple. Do it by authority and do it by example. The third thing I see in this passage is you, to be a real man, you have to have a sense of what's right and what's wrong. we got to have a sense of what's right and what's wrong. Look at what he says here. That he may keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. See, he's not to say to the kids, oh, do what God tells you to do. Let me lead you in the way of the Lord, but I'm not going to do it. There's the example. By doing righteousness and justice. Righteousness is talking about our walk with the Lord. Okay? It's about our vertical relationship with God. This is righteousness. How I walk with my God. Justice here is talking about how we walk among each other. How we treat each other. See, and we are in a country that loves to fight for justice. Everybody's fighting for justice, right? But it's justice for who? For me. What I consider justice, that's what I want to fight for. And when I feel justified, I fight, and when you please me, then I'm okay. Normally, if the economy gets well, everybody's okay. If you give me more money, I'll, I'll be okay. This is not what it's talking about here. This is talking about walking rightly among each other. You have a need to walk right with God. Okay, man, we have a need to walk right with God. But we have a mission to do right to others. We have a need to walk right with God, and I have a mission to walk right or to do right to others. Like I said before, you got to walk the talk. And I know it's tough. I've had three kids. i got two grandkids, and it's tough. After today, they're completely changed because they were baptized, right? So they'll be nice, and it's going to be easy from now on. <laughs> That's what they told me. No? <laughs> My grandson, after he was baptized, he said, so now what? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He goes, do I have to obey God now? I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah we've been talking about this for a while. <laughs> Anyways. I don't know why I went there. But I know it's hard. <laughs> it's so cute. I know it's hard. As a matter of fact, guys, without God, it's impossible. It's not just hard. Without God, it's impossible. 
Okay? We are to walk right with God and do right to others. Second Peter 1.3 says, Seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness. God has given us everything we need to walk righteously with him and to do justice. Everything you need, he has given it to you. Seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through whom? Through the true knowledge of him, Jesus Christ, who called us by his own glory and excellence. You see, living a life of righteousness and justice is the result of of understanding that we have a divine calling. Understanding that we have to disciple others and be discipled ourselves. And when we understand the Word of God, once we accept Jesus Christ, He gives us the Holy Spirit, and He allows us to understand how I should walk with Him. How I should talk to others. Remember the old bracelet, WWJD, what would Jesus do? It was a nice slogan for a little bit, but then we all stopped. Then we all stopped thinking, okay, what am I supposed to do in this situation? What is Jesus telling me to do in this situation? That's how we walk righteously with God, and that's how we do justice with others. As you walk with God and as you allow him to use you in the life of others, you will fulfill the purpose that he created you for. This is an amazing reality to me. He says here in the, in the last verse, he says, so that, okay, he's talking about Abraham. He's going to keep the commandments. He's going to disciple so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what, we, what he has spoken about him. Don't miss the so that in that question. That means a purpose, a consequence, all right? And this is the interesting part for me. God called us, he chose us, he gave us a purpose, then he indwells us with the Holy Spirit, and he does himself that purpose through us, and at the end of it all, he rewards us for doing it. I'd never heard of anything like that before. Normally, I got to do the work to get rewarded. But God chose you, he's called you, and as you surrender your life to God, he uses it. For the purpose that he created you for. And as you produce fruit through that life, he rewards you for the fruit that he himself produced through you. Isn't that awesome? I thought that deserved an amen, but it's okay. When, when Brian preaches, then he'll, he'll get it. But that blows my mind. It just absolutely blows my mind. I feel like doing it in the commercial, right? Hebrews 11, 6 says, and without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. My friend, I know it's tough to be a, a man in this country, but you will have a future reward from God. You will have it. Jesus Christ, it says in Hebrews that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. See, for the reward set before us, we can endure this life. And we can do what we have to do regardless of the cost. Listen, I know I said a lot this morning, and uh, I know some of you probably feel, man, I, this is too much to handle, Jose. I know. I'm a dad. I'm a father. It is too much to handle. Some people say, well, God will not give you anything you can't handle. Have you heard that? I disagree with that statement. I actually get, think that God gives you things you cannot handle so that he will work through you. You see, because it is when I can't handle the situation that he works through me. Otherwise, it's just me doing it. If he gives me something I can't handle, it's okay. I don't need him. Jose can't handle it. I can say, hey, God, just stay on the sideline, baby. I got this. See, to be a real man is tough. Because without God, it's impossible. It's a tough job. It's a tough job. 
And perhaps today you feel like, you know, Jose, I've tried, man. I've tried. I feel beat up. My wife looks at me like I don't have any value. My kids don't even respect me. They just do whatever. You know, I feel beat up. I go to work, nobody respects me. And the only way I find respect is on my couch with my TV, doing what I want to do so I can feel good. And perhaps you feel that way today. You know, there's a scene on Rocky V. I'm sure everybody's seen Rocky V. I know it's Crystal's favorite, Rocky. But there's a scene on Rocky V. In Rocky V, there's a young fighter, up-and-coming fighter. His name is Tommy Gunn. And he goes to Rocky for training. But once he reaches his place in the boxing world, he says to Rocky, you know, old man, I don't need you anymore. I'm the man now. And he gets to the point where he's challenging Rocky. And in this scene, he's challenging Rocky to a fight. And Rocky kind of have had it, you know, and they go out to the street and they start ducking it out. And it seems like the guy, he's younger, he's faster, he's stronger, man. And Rocky's getting beat up. And all of a sudden, he lands on the ground. He's knocked out. I mean, lights are flashing before him. All this stuff is happening. And all of a sudden, he starts having these this visions of the fight with Ivan Drago that is killing him. And, this, and he's just hitting the canvas over and over again in his mind, you know, blood coming all over the place. His old trainer is there crying. Oh, my goodness. His wife is on the other side crying. Oh, he's dead. And all of a sudden... A man that had died, Mickey, his old trainer, pops up, comes alive in his mind. He said, one more round, kid. He said, get up, kid. Get up, you bum. That's the way I can say it in church. <laughs> and he says this, Mickey loves you. And with that, of course, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, right? The music starts, Rocky gets up, and he puts a beating on Tommy Gunn. You know, man, maybe you feel like you're in the dumps today. Maybe you're the one in the corner. And all the flashes coming by, all the vision you have is you failing to be a dad, failing to be a husband being miserable, not able to accomplish your goals, and you just feel like, I can't do it anymore. And let me tell you, man, 2,000 years ago, this man died. But you know what happened? He came back to life. And today, man, he's looking at you and saying, one more round, kid. Get up, you bum. One more round. Jesus loves you. You can't do it alone. You cannot do it alone. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, man, today is the day. Start leading today. No more excuses. This world needs you. Your children needs you. Your wife needs you. And certainly your church needs you. Your church needs you. Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Surrender your life to him. And let him do what only he can do. Let him do what only he can do.